I'd like to introduce you to our session moderator, Dr. Marshall Summer. Dr. Summer joined Children's National in 2010, where he built and leads the Rare Disease Institute. He is best known for his work in developing registries and treatment standards for rare diseases. His laboratory work currently focuses on filling gaps in knowledge and testing for biochemical rare disorders. He has been listed with Best Doctors in America since 2004. Dr. Summer was formerly chair of Nord's Board of Directors and helped develop Nord programs around natural history studies, undiagnosed disorders, and clinical centers of excellence in rare disease. He currently serves as chair of Nord's Scientific and Medical Advisory Committee. And now I'll turn it over to Dr. Summer. Marcia, thank you so very much. This is going to be an exciting uh, group. We've got a great list of speakers today. Let me introduce them to the audience very quickly. First, we have Dr. Ewan Ashley, graduated with first class honors in physiology and medicine from the University of Glasgow. He completed medical residency and a PhD at the University of Oxford before moving to Stanford University in 2006, where he trained in cardiology and advanced heart failure. His group is focused on the science of precision medicine. 2010, he led the team that carried out the first clinical interpretation of a human genome. That's a pretty impressive thing. In 2018, he was awarded the American Heart Association Medal of Honor for Genomic and Precision Medicine. He was appointed Stanford Associate Dean in 2019, and earlier this year, his first book, The Genome Odyssey, Medical Mysteries and the Incredible Quest to Solve Them, was released. Next, we have Dr. Wendy Chung, who is a clinical and molecular geneticist. She is the Kennedy Family Professor of Pediatrics and Medicine and the Director of Clinical Genetics. She received her BA in Biochemistry and Economics from Cornell University, her MD from Cornell University Medical College, and her PhD from the Rockefeller University in Genetics. Dr. Chung directs NIH-funded research programs in human genetics of pulmonary hypertension, autism, birth defects, including congenital congenital diaphragmatic hernia, and congenital heart disease. She is a national leader in the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics. She currently leads the Precision Medicine Resource and Irving Institute at Columbia University. And last and certainly not least is Dr. P.J. Brooks. He's a program director in the NIH National Center for Advancing Translational Science, also known as NCATS, Office of Rare Disease Research, ORDR. Dr. Brooks received his PhD in neurobiology from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. After completing a postdoctoral fellowship at the Rockefeller University, Brooks became an investigator in the NIH intramural program. He developed an internationally recognized research program focused on rare neurologic diseases resulting from defective DNA repair. Since joining NCATS and ORDR, Dr. Brooks is interested in accelerating clinical trials and rare disease by moving beyond one disease at a time. Approaches Dr. Brooks has recently elected, sorry, uh, Dr. Brooks was recently elected as the Interdisciplinary Scientific Committee Chair for the International Rare Disease Research Consortium, uh, which is, is an acronym, the acronym for that one's a hard one, PJ, to work with, isn't it? Um, yeah, very drunk. Yeah. So really excited to have you all here today. So we're going we're gonna to kick this off. So we're going to start off with each of us answering a question, which is, what is the current breakthrough that you think is most impactful in the field? And as moderator, I'm going to get to go first, so I'm going to preempt a, a few things here. For me, the most impactful breakthrough has been uh, the completion of the human genome, but the availability of next-generation sequencing in the clinic. What that has done for our ability to diagnose conditions previously that we could not um, to provide information for families, but also to find mechanisms for diseases and conditions we didn't know about before. That, to me, has been the biggest breakthrough. With the cost reduction in next-generation sequencing, it's made it much more available. So we're finding disease links to clinical conditions and genes at the rate of 5 to 10 a week. The growth in uh, those assignments is just absolutely staggering. So that's my favorite one. I'm going to let PJ go next, and then we'll do Wendy and you on. Thanks, Marshall. So to me, the, what I'm most excited about right now is genome editing um, for the treatment of monogenic diseases. 
and I think that's, I can say that's current now because there actually are some clinical trials ongoing using genome editing. Um, and there's even some approved drugs actually using genome editing for, for development of CAR-T therapies. And we think about monogenic diseases, I mean, the advantage is we know what the cause is, which is a genetic mutation or mutations, and we know what the solution is, which would be to correct those. Twenty years ago, though, if you said, we'll just make some enzymes that will go into cells, correct the DNA mutation, people would have laughed at you at that idea. But now we can actually do it, and I think the potential of that for treating multiple rare monogenic diseases is something I'm very excited about and very heartened to see that it's actually ongoing now. All right. Wendy, you, take, you get the next swing at it. Yep. So I'm kind of in the middle between Marshall and PJ. So it is my, my favorite is being able to scale the diagnosis of genetic conditions, most of which are rare, um, but to be able to empower families and providers to work together to be able to get to the point of what PJ is talking about, which is to enable the treatments. And so it's really in terms of improving access, which is what Marshall alluded to. Um, but I really want to blow the roof off of this. I mean, I think what Marshall said, we are increasing access. We are certainly doing this much better than we did 10 years ago, but I think we're just seeing the liftoff, just barely seeing in terms of what we can do with this. And everyone now in terms of what otherwise look like similar conditions, really in terms of stratification by molecular basis, I think can help us in terms of understanding better prognosis. And as PJ said, we ultimately need to know what to target with that gene editing to be able to line up in the right line for that editing or whatever therapy it might be. So that's a little bit of a look to where we are, but even more looking forward to the future in terms of what Marshall was saying. Okay, Yon, please. Well, yeah, I think uh, my answer would be complementary to, to the others. I, you mentioned next-generation sequencing and the huge impact it's had on patients and, and discovering new diseases. We've mostly done that through something called exome sequencing, which, as, as many in the audience know, is sequencing the 2% of the genome that, that codes for the genes. But we're actually at the moment of transition, I think, where we're going to start to look towards really sequencing everything in between as well. And that's important because it gives us an actual, um, a more uh, precise and uh, more even uh, look at the genome. It allows us to look beyond just single letter changes to be able to do a better job of looking for big changes in the genome, which is very exciting. And then it allows us to do one other thing, which, um, you know, for many rare diseases, we, we have certain individuals who have a severe form and some who have a much milder form. And at the moment, we scratch our heads a bit and say we don't really understand why. And I think bringing the whole genome to the bedside of, of our patients is going to start to give us clues as to why some patients have severe forms and some have mild forms, because we'll, be, we'll be able to look at the rest of the genome and, and look at the way in which it modifies the main a genetic variant that causes the rare disease to, to allow us to really understand better why, why some family members, even in the same family, have a disparate presentation with more severe or, or more mild. So that's, that's what I'm really excited about for the next few years. All right, we're going to get into a little bit of conversation about this. And let's start with this topic around next generation sequencing. Um, of course, you know, I can remember when we first started doing chromosome microarrays and before that cytogenetics, which I think most of us can and how it took a long time to figure out what all these changes meant. And then whole exome came along, and, you know, you've got a sort of a big exponential increase there. Given the exponential increase in the amount of information in the human genome, what are the tools um, that all of you may see coming down the pike that are going to allow us to make clinical sense of this? And since we're talking to an audience of folks who either have a rare disease or are very interested in those rare disease. Wendy, why don't you lead us off on that one? Sure. So for a lot of the viewers, they already know what club they're in. They know what their rare disease is. But I would argue that for all of us, we really need to be able to increase the size of our clubs to be able to advocate for our conditions, to appreciate that they're not as rare as some of us might think they are. And I would bet you for those folks that are out there, for every one person they know about, they're anywhere between 10 and 500 more people that just don't know they have the same condition. And so we've got to be able to uh, increase the access in terms of that. 
So then the question becomes, how do you drive down the price? How do you increase or decrease the sort of computational load to be able to do that? How do you scale, which is what I was getting to before? I would challenge us that I bet, so if you want to think about what Ewan was talking about with the genome, we can probably, if we negotiate the price right, you know, get it for about $800, $900 or so in terms of data generation. Could we get that down by an order of magnitude? I mean, let's challenge ourselves in terms of as a community. When you start opening that up, then I think you can scale in terms of access. And when you think about then the computational ability, one other thing that I'll say is an enabler, I think, is to interpret everyone's genome. So in terms of being able to understand what this means, and this was an equity issue that I feel very strongly about, is we need to be able to understand everyone's genome in an equal way. I'm not saying right now that for rare variants it's easy no matter what the color of your skin or where your ancestors were from from around the world, but the delta we need to do is in terms of right now 80% of the genomic information we understand represents 20% of the world's population for the most part. There's an inequity there in terms of the balance, and we need to write that. And so that's the thing that I think we can do in the near term to both scale this and to this accurately. And like I said, with decreasing the cost of sequencing, we will be able to do this informatically relatively swiftly. Ewan, I'm going to let you take a next stab at it, repeat, and then we'll pull PJ in on this one. Yeah, no, these are really great points that, that Wendy makes. I could not agree more. We need to solve the disparity and diversity challenge that, that we've had. Um, and I think that once, you know, as we get towards doing that, and we need to do that both for uh, genomes in the population so that we understand within the population uh, what the general variation is. And we need to do it for our patients by making uh, these, this technology available to all patients, no matter their socioeconomic status, no matter where they are in the world. I, I could not agree more with, with what Wendy said. I think then when we are in that spot and we have that data in one place, taking account, first of all, of, of privacy and making sure that everybody's data is, is owned by them and that they have control over who it's shared with, then we have a really exciting opportunity to start to connect those genomes. And imagine if there is essentially a kind of hive mind that sits in the background. And when, when a patient presents with a, a new disease in, 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 on the West Coast of, of the United States and a variant pops up in their genome, that without any effort, without needing luck, without uh, needing lots of emails connecting individuals, that that data can be connected with the patient who just presented in, you know, in, in Darwin in, in, in Australia. Uh, because when we get those two patients together, we then understand the new condition in a way that we never did before. And then soon there could be 100, as, as Wendy said, 500. And we, I think making those connections in a way that's really secure from a data privacy standpoint, but really powerful from a connection standpoint, I think that's what happens next. And, and I'm really excited about that potential. PJ? Time away. Yeah. Yeah, I want to pick up on something Wendy said, which is the idea of you get your genetic diagnosis and you join a club, which is the club of people who have the disease. And I think that's what most people think about. But I think what is less well appreciated is the potential clinical and therapeutic implications of the individual mutation or mutations that a patient has. Because realizing that can put you in a different club. In fact, in some cases, a much, much larger club that has therapeutic implications. So for example, a common kind of mutation that causes genetic disease are what we call premature stop codons. So it's, it's basically a, a message that tells the cell to stop making a protein too early, and you end up with a fragment of a protein that doesn't work. And that's a common kind of mutation that cuts across thousands of rare genetic diseases. Um, and there are actually people now developing therapeutics that would allow the cell to read through those premature stop codons. So if you have one of those, you're not just diagnosed with a disease, you're essentially diagnosed with a different disease, which you might think of as premature stop codon disease. And when you group those people together, you can have much larger groups of people, and I think that has important implications for clinical trials, and it's also something that we are now starting to fund research on at the NIH and NCATS specifically. I'd say one of the things that's out there in popular culture is that DNA sequencing has a certain magic to it. I think everyone's watched crime shows, things like that, where in a 45-minute episode, you get the DNA exactly find out what's going on and then wrap everything up. Um, yeah. One of the most common answers we get from next generation sequencing these days, at least in our clinic, is maybe. 
And I think that makes this um, information different. And it's sort of like, it might not, it looks like it might be this today, but we need to kind of develop the data some. Do you all see that continuing as a trend for a while, or do you think we'll be able to move past that very quickly? I, th I think it's a longer trend. I'd be curious to see what you say. Whoever wants to pick it up. Well, I think in saying maybe that we, we are sometimes putting some kind of a probability on it. And, and you yeah. know, sometimes our maybe is 30% probability, sometimes it's 60%. We have this this uh, group of categorization for variants that will be familiar to many in the audience, a variant of unknown significance. And, and I sort of, you know, I think we all hate that, don't we? Uh, it's, yeah, exactly. Because <laughs> it's, it's for so many reasons, because anything unknown is, is generally bad within medicine, but also because it's so vague and it covers such a large group of variants. Some variants that were so close, like if we just got one little bit of more evidence, we'd it'd tip us over and we really would feel confident enough to call this the, the, the variant that was causing the condition. But other times it's like squarely in the middle. It's just we just can't move ourselves from that way. So I do see us increasing the probability uh, through a number of different ways, some exciting new things like there are experiments, we call them saturation mutagenesis, which is a, a whole bunch of words that just mean in the lab, we can start to model every single possible variant in a given gene in, in a cell model and start to provide some extra information in advance of the patient showing up in the clinic that might help us just push us over the edge when we get one of those BUSs. Um, and so I do see that um, I think we're going to be stuck with maybe for a while, but I'm hoping that that group will get smaller and we'll be able to push up the probability a little bit higher. Wendy, so, I know you have a lot of... Oh, sorry. Uh, go ahead, Wendy. I think, yeah. No. I'll, I'll, go ahead, I'll PJ. Go. I'll chime in later. Well, I guess, I, I guess I'm a little bit more hopeful, Marshall, although I should also say I'm not a clinician, so I may be rather naive about this. But what's always struck me is that for almost every gene, almost every protein... Somewhere in the world, there's someone who has tremendous expertise and they know all the mutations and they may even have them, you know, clones of them in their lab somewhere. And if you get to that person and, and, and get that information of your VUS to that person and they could test it out in, in his or her laboratory, they could probably get you an answer that would be pretty clear. And I, I often wondered if there's not a way to connect the clinicians that need that information with the expert and that off maybe very obscure protein that could help out somehow. I think that's one of the things actually Nord's trying to do with some of our registry programs, you know, pulling things together. You know, the old field of dreams, if you build it, they will come, you know, find a place for these investigators to find patients. Wendy, go ahead and so add in I'm, on this I'm one. I'm going to take off on PJ's point and add a point, which is that there are researchers that are expert. I also think that one of the things, I, I try and make lemonade out of the lemons that COVID gave us. And one is actually what we're doing right now, uh, which is that, you know, we're on video, we're around the country at least. And I also think about special expertise that some of our clinicians have in addition to our researchers. And why can't our patients be able to access the expert, be it in the United States or around the world potentially, um, in terms of the real true expertise once they get either a maybe or even a definitive diagnosis, but someone who really knows what they're talking about. And I'll even say, how do we combine those with their local provider so that their local provider can learn and implement that in their clinical home? So take that expertise, but bring it home locally. And isn't that a better way to provide care for patients for rare disorders? Um, there are some, I don't know, I'm going to call them silly licensure issues in the United States. I don't mean to, you know, sort of poke fun at things, but there are some reasons why we as doctors don't do that, that I wish weren't there. We actually took those down for a brief period of time with COVID. And I actually can tell you that enormous numbers of patients that I saw virtually, I know that was a good experience for them. So I, I, I'm wondering whether we could learn something from that process. Um, the final other point that I'll make is that I, I see patients across the life course. And um, some of the maybes that I see, I even start to see before they're born. So I see prenatal patients and we're limited in how much we can see from them because they're still inside, they're still in the womb and we can't see everything on ultrasound. And so one of the things is that those maybes become more definitive because we just see that individual born and grow up and sort of grow into
to the what we're what we know to be that condition, or we have more evidence, more data that we've collected. So I, I want to come back to one thing that you and I don't know if he did it consciously or not, but the conversation I have with patients is exactly the quantitative conversation he was having with you. I say to patients, you know what? I'm not certain, but I'm 30% certain, and I'm somewhere between 40 and 20, you know, 20 and 40%. Here's my confidence interval, and I'm very transparent, and when we have conversations following that, I say, I just upped it. Now I'm 50%, and you know what's going to get me to 80% is when I find two other people in the world, so help me find them. You go on Facebook, put a sign up, say, this is who you are, this is your variant, and let's together get that evidence so that we can get up to 80%. And with those conversations, I'm not saying everyone has to do that, but I make this really a cooperative team effort. If you can do your part, this is what I can do, and this is what it gets us together in terms of the certainty and how we're going to use that information. I think with that type of attitude, some people will find very much empowered to be able to do their part and add to the improvement of their own care. Absolutely agree with all of that. The old phrase, building the plane while you fly it, I think does actually apply to this. And it's a little bit new in the field of medicine. People like certainty. People like this is a yes, this is a no. But I think in this new age, it's, it's going to be a little bit different. Well, let's take the other side of the diagnostic coin here, which um, while we've created the world's largest lever, uh, at least from a biological understanding standpoint with um, sequencing the genome, what's the, um, what's the fulcrum we put that on, which is the physical diagnosis or the phenotype of the patient or the description of the patient? What do you see as some of the new things coming along there? I know obviously in the world of cardiology, I suspect there's some very exciting things going on. If you want to Tell us a little bit about that, Wendy and PJ Singh. We're going to end up on some therapeutics here, which PJ, we'll get, we're going to circle to that in just a minute. Yeah, well, I, so I, I'm, I am fascinated by our idea and understanding of, of diseases uh, and even the history of, of diseases. And, I, you know, we, we often classify diseases according to the technology that is most up to date at the time those diseases are, are first recognized. And that's very true within, within cardiology. You know, originally we had just the stethoscope, you know, I, have, I just came from, from clinic and I, I have one here, we still use it. Um, and, you know, we used to de de define diseases according to the noises that your heart made. And, and that was the, the highest technology we had. Then someone invented an electrocardiogram, stick the, the, the uh, stickers on your chest and look at the electrical tracing of the heart. And so we started to define diseases according to that. And then we discovered ultrasound. And now we can see the heart moving in real time. All along, we've moved towards a, a point, especially for rare disease in, in cardiovascular realm, where we can now really start to define them, as you mentioned, Marshall, according to this molecular microscope, which is really exciting. So we've talked a lot about that, and we increasingly start to think not just about diseases according to the gene that causes them, but even according to the region of the gene that's affected, because clearly there are, it's like a branching tree. You can, it depends how far out on the tree you want to go. Uh, but your question was specifically, and for this one, not about the molecular one. Uh, we are increasingly using technologies like MRI, cardiac MRI, where we can look at the heart in much uh, more uh, detail, both from a time dimension perspective and also uh, from, from a resolution perspective. We can, we can look much more clearly kind of almost into the heart muscle and start to see some changes there that help us understand that diseases maybe we thought were all one before. We had them all in the same basket, all with the same label we now realize are multiple different diseases. And that's particularly the case for a group that we call arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathies, which just means to say that the, the patients who have those have particularly bad rhythms of the heart. And I think that before we thought there was really just one of those and it was on the right side of the heart and, and that was the main disease, but we really now have divided that up in many different ways. And this is in some ways the essence of what precision medicine is, the idea of like being more precise about how we define a disease so that we can then target a therapy at it, what PJ is doing, you're doing so well with his gene therapy and, and other approaches. And so that is, is something that, you know, continues to be really exciting. Defining disease at a higher level, whether it's using DNA, as we've discussed already, or using imaging technologies or, or other functional technologies that allow us to just really understand at a deep level to point our way down the road towards a much more precise therapeutic. PJ or Wendy, want to chime in? on the importance of phenotyping or disease description? So I'll give some a couple examples, one very personal example, but uh, give you some insight. So 
I've said the word scale, and I'm going to use the word scale again. Um, you know, how do we do this on larger scale? Because there is such heterogeneity, and it extends over the life course. It extends with COVID, without COVID. You know, things change, and how do we measure that? And how do we do it in a way that's meaningful? In other words, not necessarily just what we see, especially when it comes to behaviors and some other things when we bring someone into the office or into our research laboratories, but how do we do it in a naturalistic setting when they're on their own element, when it's life in the way it really is, and how do we do that on scale so that we can get enough granularity of the data that we can see changes that are statistically significant, clinically significant, and meaningful and reproducible in this. Um, so I'll give you one example, and all of this is uh, also about patient empowerment or individual empowerment. So I'll tell you a personal example. Before Christmas this year, um, right before Christmas, my son, who was otherwise healthy, was sitting there, and uh, he realized his heart wasn't feeling quite right. He started feeling just funny in his chest, is the way he described it to me. And believe it or not, you and I'll appreciate this, uh, he grabbed his grandmother's phone that had an EKG on the back of it, put his thumbs up on there, did his EKG, and we figured out what his heart rhythm was, which wasn't a good heart rhythm at the time, unfortunately, uh, but with that, instantaneously diagnosed him, got him into the ER where they eventually, where they uh, ended up quickly cardio converting him, thankfully. Um, but that, I mean, just imagine that in terms of that technology, that ability to phenotype and doing it basically on your own. Now, I'm not saying I'm a doctor. I want to, you know, appreciate this. We had his cardiologist involved. I, you know, we didn't go rogue in terms of doing all of this. But we didn't that, grab the wires from the lamp or anything like that. <laughs> but, no, exactly. But, you know, that type of technology is available in your home, right? And so we've thought about how can you do that in terms of if you want to monitor sleep. And I'm, again, I'm in COVID time and I can say for myself, sleep for me was different than it was two years ago. Uh, and I'm just putting myself out there, right? So if we wanted to look at people in terms of how they're sleeping, we have sleep monitors. We could have a mat, we could have an electronic mat under near the mattress be able to see how you're sleeping. We have wearables. I have individuals in terms of behavioral and psychiatric conditions who may not be able to or want to tell me all the time how they're doing, but looking at their pulse rate variability, looking at, you know, a little bit of sweat that they have on their wrist and seeing when they get anxious. Now I have some sense in a very granular way, because I can monitor this if they want me to, 24-7 essentially, to see how they're doing in terms of those things. People can monitor on your phone how you're doing in terms of how many mistakes you're making as you're typing, um, to be able to get a sense of cognitively, are you having problems with cognitive decline, or you're not doing as well in terms of that sleep and your mental function. There are innumerable ways that you could get a lot of granular data and feedback either for yourself for a research study, for your doctor. I'm conscious of everything you and said with privacy, so I want to be very clear. Yeah. Um, this is not Big Brother coming in and like watching your every move and you know doing things. But there are ways if you wanted to use these types of technology on scale in a very big way, like I said, to be able to do it for good in the sense of being able to understand your own body, your own function with the hope that, again, I'm going to come back to the sort of precision medicine scheme, doing it also in real time and making informed decisions because you're getting real-time data readout. And then being able to see, does it have that effect? So as PJ starts talking about our interventions with epilepsy, for instance, can I have a way of being able to monitor those seizures at home that whatever magical way he figures out how to be able to do this, we can have real readout in terms of being able to see sooner rather than later, whether we're having an impact and if it's a positive impact or not. So I'm really excited about those types of opportunities. I think one thing that's going to be required for this, just as kind of one of my own observations, is we've developed some incredible technologies, some incredible abilities, but we actually have a lot of what I would say legacy systems in place, whether it's electronic medical record or some regulations and things like that, that really kind of prevent us from... Um, realizing the full potential of some of these things. So I'm, I'm hoping that we'll catch, what is it, reach exceeds grasp or grasp exceeds reach. We'll be able to catch up with that eventually. PJ, before we move on to a therapeutic topic, you want to throw in anything about phenotype and uh, yeah. diagnosis, please? I do. Actually, I want to, I want to, my contribution is going to be to ask Wendy a question. And it's something I've often thought about for behavioral disorders, psychiatric disorders, autism, things like that. 
where it's a behavioral issue, the extent to which one might use, say, video recording of a patient in their own home, either in a research setting or a di you know, diagnostic setting. Because it's always struck me that that would be a lot better than, than bringing somebody with a behavioral disorder to a sterile oh. clinic. And yep. is that something that's, I've heard they've done some of that in Angelman syndrome. And I wonder if you could just talk about that. Wendy, can I jump in here real quick? Sure. Actually, last year we did about 10,000 um, telemedicine visits in our clinic with a lot of our patients with Angelman's, but with autism, the quality of the visits was so much better. And also parents would record their children as well, too. So yeah. a patient that might have come in and just been completely out of control with a horrible visit for them, for the prior providers and everybody, suddenly became us being able to watch a child wandering around their house, doing the things they normally did. It was night and day for us and, and much easier on the patient. Wendy, I hope I didn't preempt your answer. No, no, no. I wasn't going to say that exactly, but you're, I can tell you myself, we've had the same exact experience. And I do think for children that are sensitive to those situations, it's incredibly valuable. Um, but PJ, to um, try and quantify some of those behaviors in a rigorous way, especially as I think for clinical trials and clinical trial readiness, absolutely. So we've had things that we call beacons, for instance. So in autism, one of the issues is how sociable is a person, how much are they interacting, talking with each other. We have devices now with beacons that, so that you can actually track the person, for instance, with autism, the proximity to other individuals, and actually have an electronic readout in terms of when they're close, when they're in the same room, measure that in a quantifiable way. We have ways of recording language, and so being able to know how many reciprocal interchanges someone has, how long those last, um, even without being able to necessarily get the content, you can just, again, quantitatively very quickly see how much is someone talking? Or are they actually doing it back and forth? Or is it a one-way conversation? Um, so again, things like that, I think, uh, how do you do it on scale? There's the next part of it, which is also fun, um, if you want the challenge, is to then chart to think about the content. You know, so using natural language processing, artificial intelligence, you know, is someone just talking about Pokemon, 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 you know, is in a conversation that's like that? Or is it really a meaningful, like I said, um, you know, sort of, um, less scripted conversation that may be helping in terms of the behavioral interchanges. So we've kind of spent the first bit of this conversation on the what do you have or what is it. Let's talk next about what do you do about it. And I think there's a lot of exciting things going on there. PJ, I'm going to let you kick this off because it's, I think it's in all of our wheelhouses, but this is something that you really are leading the way on. Well, thanks. So, I mean, I think the potential of genome editing to treat disease, as I said, is something that we're already seeing in the clinic, but we're kind of seeing the, the phase, you know, version 1.0 of genome editing, where basically the enzymes go in and they make a cut in both strands of the DNA and they, they cause damage. In some cases that can, that can mess up the DNA and cause a mutation, but in certain circumstances that can be beneficial for dominant diseases, for example. And that's what we're seeing now. Um, but I think the most exciting things coming down the pike are enzymes that are based on derivatives of, of CRISPR-Cas9 that are called sing, you know, single base editors and their variants that can actually go in and, and change one single base to another. So cor just immediately correct a single base mutation. And quite a few genetic diseases are caused by single base mutations. Yeah. And you can imagine a certain situation then where if you could deliver that genome editor into a cell and correct that single base mutation. Extending that approach to different disease or different patients is simply, simply, <laughs> simply a matter of changing the sequence of the guide RNA that tells it where to go within the genome. And I think there you can really imagine a therapeutic platform that can cut across multiple diseases based on that specific etiology. And, and these are being developed in better and better ways all the time and we'll hopefully be going to the clinic soon. There's already you know, commercialization of these. And one of the things we're doing at NIH, um, I'm involved in coordinating a program through the NIH Common Fund, which is finding better ways to deliver these genome editors into specific cells and tissues. We're quite good at delivering, delivering them to the liver. Yeah. Um, everything seems to go to the liver um, when That's you inject it in, intravenously. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of the way the body works, I understand. Um, but to be able to deliver those to the brain, the heart, you know, all these other tissues is, 
is really that one of the big challenges in this program about half of the awards in this program that I'm involved with the somatic cell genome editing consortium is focused on better delivery methods so that to me is the exciting future of, of treating monogenic disease in particular. You know, and how's this impacting cardiology? You don't have to stick with cardiology, but you yeah, got yeah. your stethoscope with you, so there you go. No, exactly. No, I, I'm happy to, to do that. Um, no, I, I mean, it is a really exciting moment, and we certainly uh, have been focused on the use of these sort of second, next generation, if you like, uh, CRISPR technologies uh, with base editors, and there's one called CRISPR Prime that also has quite a lot of, of potential which we've been thinking about. And just to mirror what, what PG said, I mean, we've now for a decade been interested in using genetic therapies to try and really correct diseases at, at source um, in a definitive way. And the challenge is, the major challenge is delivery. And so, as you mentioned, uh, the brain and the heart are particularly hard to get to. Um, other organs, uh, not so easy. The liver, pretty easy. You've probably heard of a lot of genetic therapy, thinking about the back of the eye as well as somewhere else. We take cells out of the body, we can deliver quite easily to them. But the heart and the, the brain in particular are much harder to get to. So interestingly, and, and this is something that Wendy mentioned earlier, there's a lot of silver linings that we have to look for from the pandemic. And, and one of them, interestingly, is the focus on uh, viruses, because one of the ways that we get uh, genetic therapies to the place we want them to go. It's not the only way, but one of them is by using a virus to help kind of carry it along. I know it's a virus that multiplies in your body, not one that would cause you any problem, uh, but a virus that's almost like a like a vehicle, like a car that drives to the right spot and then drops off the, the package. Um, and we've started to understand, and we, we're across the front page of every newspaper now is genetic variants in the virus that, the, that we're all concerned about with SARS-CoV-2. And I think it's, it's told us how it's just very small changes in a virus can really lead to quite different changes in, its, in the way it behaves. And I think that we can actually start to use those kind of insights uh, to really start to, to look at every variant in the viruses that we use as the vehicles to deliver these new genetic therapies, to tweak them so that we can deliver better to the heart, we can deliver better to the brain. Um, now, there's other ways as well. It doesn't have to be a virus, but I, I do like to, to think that some part of what we've learned this year with the pandemic has, has taken us into this realm where we're, we're ready to kind of engineer, if you like, these, these viruses, these vehicles better to, to, to provide the, the whole fleet of vehicles that we need to really help deliver the genetic therapies of the future, uh, base editors and others, uh, to where they need to go. I think if we develop a COVID vehicle for uh, gene therapy, it's going to require a lot of public relations. <laughs> I think uh, you might be right. I don't yeah. think I'd suggest that virus. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Wendy, try it. Well, so, so I'm going to just stick with the COVID theme for one second. So um, I don't know how many of the viewers will realize this, but the COVID vaccine that Moderna, uh, Pfizer have used is really quite remarkable. And although it was decades in the making, really leapfrogged us forward in terms of the technology of taking some lipids, some fats, basically, putting an RNA in that and delivering it to millions of people so their bodies could produce this protein that we've now allows us to build up immunity to the virus. Um, I hope we never have to go back to this type of pandemic situation in the future, but the fact that we now know that that's safe and effective as a delivery system um, brings to me some interesting opportunities. What else could you package in there? And I'm not saying every gene is going to work for this. I'm not saying it's perfect, but it is an interesting opportunity. So that's one point. The other is that I'll also go back to diagnostics yoked with therapeutics. And my point being here that you have to know, again, your diagnosis to run up for the right therapy, but the timing is critical. And the more I watch many of my patients grow up in time, the more I appreciate that. With earlier diagnosis, enabling more effective treatments as we go forward. But also the Angelman story, Angelman was mentioned just briefly, has been really remarkable to me about how far that window is open, farther than I might have appreciated, at least in some cases. Yeah. And for those of you watching who don't know the story, for the children with Angelman syndrome who were treated with an oligonucleotide, another 
technology that we haven't really focused too much on. Um, but the children, although that clinical trial, and I'll be very clear, was cut short because of some issues and some refinements that are necessary in that treatment, remarkable to see children who were, for instance, nonverbal, starting to speak their first words, children that in the summer were suddenly swimming underwater across the pool when they were having trouble just being able to walk straight and, and coordinate movements. And so that, I think, gives me new hope in terms of some of those windows being open longer. Yet, I will say, and I, I saw this firsthand with spinal muscular atrophy, the real breakthrough we had with that disease, for instance, was early diagnosis, even in newborns. I mean, at the point for that degenerative condition that we did it even before people were, were symptomatic, before they realized they had the condition. And I do think going forward, we may see an era as we have more treatments to motivate more diagnoses and diagnoses earlier, we're going to see these come together. And we're going to be much more doing pre-symptomatic diagnosis with pre-symptomatic prevention that's going to be targeted for these conditions. And I hope I live to see the day that when, we, when we're living that kind of medicine. Well, I think, yeah. you know, Wendy, if you think about it, the newborn screening programs have already laid the groundwork for that by, you know, finding disease before the patient is symptomatic. I think that's going to be a real, I mean, once we start bringing that more into the genome world, it's going to be interesting. Uh, to see how that goes forward. PJ, okay. let me ask you, oh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say in there, just a little bit of a plug, NCATS and NICHD and, and others at NIH, we're going to be having a meeting, a series of meetings actually starting in June on this exact topic of how we can, you know, better ways to diagnose patients who are amenable to gene targeted therapies and, be, and it will be addressing things like how can we adapt the newborn screening system we have now to take into account the incredible amount of genetic information that we're going to be getting? And it's a very complicated issue, in many ways, implication, ethical, legal, financial implications, but we wanted to kind of start off that discussion. And it'll be open to the public. And if, if somehow we'd be able to attach the link to this meeting here, I think that would be of interest to people. I'll, I'll ask them if they can do that. So another topic that's related to these new therapies being developed is the model we use for rare disease clinical trials now is still very wedded to what I would call the large population model of a common drug. But we're developing new therapies that are targeting specific DNA changes. So how do we adjust how we do clinical trials so that rather than having to do one for every single base change we have, we actually validate the delivery system and the methodology. Uh, I'm going to throw that one open. Well, well, not to go back to COVID again, but I, I was just going to say, and, and PJ will have a, a more to say on this, but I, I think that finally our regulatory agencies are, are looking at more uh, creative solutions to this. And I do think that the pandemic has pushed us a little bit towards that. The idea of programmable vaccines, as Wendy beautifully described, is with us now. Is we're, we're here with that. And, and I know that we were kind of used to it a little bit. There's a precedent with the flu vaccine, uh, but we're going to have to do that more. And when I think about what we try to think about with our, our patients with genetic diseases, with rare disease, I do think that there's a, a much clearer path than maybe there has ever been towards getting approval for, uh, for the vehicle, getting approval for the principal, and then just tweaking the, the individual sort of core therapeutic part of, of what we're delivering to individualize it for, for the specific patient in mind. So I'm more positive, uh, we'd love to hear from PJ, but I'm more positive than I've ever been. And I think that the, the, the pandemic am, has pushed us forward. I, I actually, I'm actually pretty optimistic, but uh, please, Wendy and PJ, or PJ and Wendy. Uh, yeah, so I guess, I, I mean, I'm involved in a couple efforts, uh, particularly one called the Bespoke Gene Therapy Consortium that we're developing. It's a public-private partnership, but we've one of the people involved in that is Peter Marks from the Center for Biologics, and we're trying to get towards this idea of making this a platform. This is particular for AAV-based gene therapy. So I am fairly hopeful on that, in large part because of the conversation I've had with Peter and his colleagues, but also I think uh, the interest in the anti oligonucleotides, antisense oligonucleotides, the, the work that Tim, you did with Mila 
and and how you can expand that and make that into a platform. I think I think I'm hopeful about the regulatory pathway. And I'll just quickly also say this: the funding opportunity we had for clinical trials of drugs targeting shared molecular etiologies and multiple diseases. We we put that out there and essentially challenged the community to kind of figure out if you got one drug that targets the same molecular target but disparate clinical endpoints, how do you deal with that in a clinical trial design? I don't know the answer. I We wrote the funding opportunity to have some smart people figure it out and maybe by trial and error, but I think that's that's one one approach to it. So I'm going to be uh, a Debbie Downer for a second, um, which is to say that although, again, I'm incredibly hopeful about the opportunities, we have had some setbacks this last year in terms of gene therapy clinical trials. And I want to be honest with our public about this. You know, we yeah. did have three deaths in a muscular dystrophy trial, and we still have improvements to be made in this. And so I do think once we get to a steady, safe state where we know that these delivery vectors, these methods we're talking about really are safe, I do have a lot of confidence that the FDA and the regulatory agencies will let us do this uh, much more effectively on scale for rare N of 1 types of conditions. I don't think we're there yet, though. And so I think why you're hearing us talk about some different methods um, or that there are different strategies. I think, personally, that we may use some things like ASOs as a bridge to a permanent solution. And so for the audience that may not know what I'm talking about, um, these types of oligonucleotides uh, require repeated treatment, and that's the good and the bad. They're not forever, and that's the bad, because you have to keep doing the repeated treatment. But they're also, if we haven't optimized things like we didn't in the Angelman trial, it's okay. It doesn't last forever and these symptoms uh, hopefully are reversible. And so I do see a period where we're still learning. You've heard us, we're, we're building the plane as we're flying it, and I want to be really transparent. We don't have, you know, like a 747 ready to go yet. No, um, and so as we do this, though, and as we iterate, there may be short-term things we can do as a bridge to, as PJ is saying, when we will be able to do definitive gene surgeries in terms of these and really come up with permanent solutions. So I think as we're all doing this, I also want to say, even with the fanciness we're talking about, I think we have improvements in terms of standards of care, even with no new breakthroughs, simply being able to do right by our patients using existing technologies, existing medications, existing treatments, but just getting the word out about what are those things that you should be doing with your rare disease and making sure that you and your doctors are on the same page, have access to that information and use what we have already today. I think using that, again, as a short-term bridge, longer term, a temporizing measure that we have to repeatedly do something to ultimately a permanent solution. If we think in those types of terms, I think we won't be disappointed and I think we'll be able to all get there faster. Yeah. I think one thing to point out for the audience too is we can't really always turn back the clock. In some diseases, the progression is such that even if we can halt, stop, or even fix Certainly. the disease in every cell, we may not be able to undo damage that's already been done. All right, so let's do a little bit of a thought experiment here. So we've talked about kind of what's in the, or coming into the world of reality. Some of it's already here. What's that new big development we need uh, in your, in each of y'all's opinion, that's going to take us to that next level or really open up and expand things? And Yon, I'm going to let you go first this time. I'm going to pick on you. Oh, on me? Yep. Oh, sorry. I apologize. I missed, I missed two you were picking on there. Uh, we've covered so much here, uh, you know, and so, so much that um, is coming and, and that has arisen in the recent past that I think that we, we in, in a sense, have been talking a little bit about what the immediate future will hold. You know, my excitement about the future, I think, is, is in resolving all the, the different things that we have. I think in a way it might not be one big, big sort of meteor coming in from the side that changes everything, but rather the incremental addition of, of solving each of these little individual problems. So at the beginning, we talked about how new technology and sequencing to, let's say, the whole genome rather than just the exome will, will take us a little further. We'll be able to, to peer into dark corners of the genome that we, we weren't able to before with new technologies. We didn't talk about long read sequencing, but that's that's an exciting area. So I think that will take us a little bit of the way. Uh, I think better communications and connections will take us a bit of the way. 
more diversity, as we talked about, where we understand populations for comparison and we just have much better representation of the globe with our genetic data, that will take us part of the way. And then I think when, when that happens, we'll, we'll be so much better at, at diagnosis and we'll have identified so many more conditions, as you said, Marshall, at the beginning, that that bridge across the therapy will be so much better and, and busier, uh, more, so much more populated. And I think that will work out in, in a timing way with where we start to solve some of these delivery problems. We, we aren't, we're ready with the small plane, maybe not the 747, but you know, over time, I think we start to solve each of those. Um, then we're going to connect that much better diagnosis with a much better sense of, of what the diseases are. We talked about that too, phenotype, with this therapeutic. And then I think there's an, a multiplication effect happens. It, it isn't then at that point just the addition of better diagnosis plus better therapeutics, but there's a multiplier where we suddenly get this, this exponential increase in, in our ability to solve these conditions for families and patients who, who are currently suffering. So I didn't quite answer your question in the way you asked it, but that is, that is my honest answer. <laughs> All right. Wendy, why don't you go next? So I'm going to riff off of you and, and I'm going to do the first half and I'm going to leave the second half for PJ. But so you alluded to, uh, PJ and Marshall both alluded to this, as did Ewan. Um, I can see a day in the not too distant future where we're going to do whole genome sequencing as an option for newborn screening. And in terms of being able to then enable what we're talking about, so it's going to be number one from an equity point of view, because this is a public health initiative. Yes. Yes. Every baby gets the same chance at the best and healthiest life they can have, right? Everyone, not based on where you are, who you know, what your insurance is, the color of your skin, everyone. So I think that's the first step. That actually helps us deal with the, in terms of the dark corners, it's genomes in terms of being able to understand that and being able to understand more people, I think actually helps our interpretive problem and putting together the infrastructure of experts virtually so that you can phone a friend essentially. When you need that help, you're diagnosed with that condition, you don't know what that foos is, you've got already built in an expert of people like Ewan and PJ and Marshall and me, and it just, we get a boop in terms of a pat, tap on the shoulder with when you need that help. And we exist, we are out here, and I think we could be used more effectively. You've got to figure out a way to pay us, which is an important point in this. But um, in terms of this, I do think it would improve things so that everyone is lined up and ready when PJ and others like him come up with those treatments that are ready. Um, but I do think by, there is going to be just so much that we learn, as Ewan was saying, simply by having this all in front of us and being able to, like I said, do it for everyone. DJ? Yeah, I really like Wendy's vision, actually. I think that's really nice. I, I guess, you know, if I had to push a little bit, I my dream would be a way to deliver genome editors into every cell in the body, including a way to get them to inject them into the bloodstream and have them go across the blood brain barrier to every brain cell. Um, the only limitation of that, of course, is we have to be very careful that we don't deliver them to germ cells because we do not want to be editing the germ line and, and creating, you know, heritable genetic mm -hmm. modifications. We don't want to be doing that. But I think, I think the opportunity for what we call somatic genome editing is so huge. And if we could get some of these much better delivery vehicles, um, I think that, and obviously that's something we're, we're you know, trying to do, so. All right, so I'm, I'm going to, I've got two actually, so I'm, I'm going to come up with two here. One of which is we need a little bit of a shift in our way of thinking about disease, which is currently a very reactive and doing something about it. We're very procedure-based, we're very test-based, we're doing that. In medicine, we've gotten away a little bit from thinking about what do you do, thinking about what's the best way to treat that. Um, so, in other words, and this comes back to what you said, Wendy, you don't really get paid to think these days, you get paid to do. But I think if we think very carefully about what it is we're doing, we'll do what, things will go much better from that standpoint. So, I'd like to see a little bit of a shift where we place more emphasis on thinking these things through. Then the other thing I would wish to see is systems where we have much better, much easier connectivity. That digital tap on the shoulder Wendy talked about, uh, you, know, you know, the thing where you've got the genome in place, but it's continuously being reevaluated digitally. So if something pops up, you know, you can actually advance your knowledge about that. Um, finding folks like PJ, so when you do come across something that's relevant, 
it's not an effort to connect. I think all human interaction requires a certain amount of activation energy. The more we can lower that, the more we can make it very easy to exchange the information, to exchange the knowledge, and this involves the patients. To be honest, they can drive this much better than we can. Um, you know, patients should own their own data. Patients should have control over where that's going, and I find in the rare disease community, patients are incredibly generous about sharing their information, uh, even in something that won't help them. They want to help that next generation out, and I think there's a lot that our audience can do to help drive, you know, building that connectivity, building that sharing. Insist on it. Demand on it. So, closing thoughts, everybody. Um, I will go randomly. PJ, you go first. Boy, we've covered a lot. I think um, it's a really exciting time for rare disease therapy development and for all the reasons we said. Uh, but I also do think we have some pretty tremendous challenges and we would not want to underestimate those. Okay. Wendy? I'm more hopeful now than I've ever been for the group of uh, rare disease conditions. Um, and one of my mottos, though, is the care until the cure. So for those of you out there, insist on the best care that we have until we get to the cure. But I'm hopeful that we will get to the cure. Yeah. Well, yeah, Marshall, you mentioned at the beginning that I'd, I'd recently uh, written this book. And one of the things that I, I did for that was go talk to patients I'd known over the course of 10 years and just have them retell their stories to me. And I think that the world we live in is just full of these incredible stories. Our, our patients, the families, and what they live, live through just to have all of us, I think, in, in awe. Um, and, and I think that what I, my closing thought is that we are going to get to a better place through all the technology we talked about, but we're going to get there through partnership. And I think yeah. that's the most important thing. I think we all feel such a privilege in being able to be part of the lives of, of these patients and these families who've been afflicted with these conditions. We're so desperate to help but we, we're going to be doing it together. And so we walk along the path alongside our patients and, and we, we live each day alongside them, hopefully uh, aiming to, to make their lives better. And I think that uh, we doing that together is, is, is the way forward. So that's, that's the, the thought I'd like to earn with that sort of thanks and, and partnership. It's interesting. I'm, actually, what I was going to say is very similar um, to our families out there in the audience. You allow us into your lives in a way that almost no one, no one else yeah. um, gets in. And um, it's a privilege for us. Um, you've allowed us to have what I would say are some of the most interesting and fascinating careers possible. But also, we always remember, and I think our, the panelists definitely emphasize this, at the end of the day, this is about you. This is about what can we do to make things better? What can we do to understand them better? So... We really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, I want to thank all of my panelists. Uh, what a great group here. It has been fun to moderate this group. And uh, stay tuned. Nord's got a lot of interesting things coming out that are going to address some of the things we're talking about. So, um, Wendy, you'll probably know about this one, but we'll actually be doing some things around National Centers of Excellence and Rare Disease so that it's easier to find a place to go. So stay tuned for that.